the passion well you, you just saw in Dan's uh, illustrations here is, the, is what's missing in the church today. Uh, the apathy that is there, the surrender. Uh, and we read it in uh, 2 Timothy 3, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money. Mm -hmm. and, and this is in our uh, headlines. Boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. There are some 20 descriptions of today's people, and it's in the church just as well as it is in the public square. But then he goes on and says later, however, continue, Timothy, in the things that you have learned and become convinced. And then he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof. We have in the church need to be reproved for our lack of courage. And then for correction, setting us right. And then he says, for training in righteousness. That's why I call my show, Writing the Right bringing our country back to the right of center where our founding fathers were. And as a ship is waning and is tipping over and the sails are almost hitting the sea, we need to right the ship and bring it back up. And that is a this description of a man looking to God. And it's not our battle as we're talking about. It's not the Christian's battle. It's God's battle and he's winning and we want to be in his army. And we want to implement all of the pastors, all of the churches, all of the Christians in Boston to follow in God's will, in God's direction. We're not trying to create our own revival or create our own. This is about writing the right by, by exposing what is truthful and what is not truthful and then going from there. Well, what you are expressing is the, the total antithesis of what we see right now in American politics and even in the church, which is more um, leadership by uh, looking at the wind, so to speak, and, and by taking polls and by seeing where the nation is going. And we see that in the Republican Party even, unfortunately, where there's uh, so much uh, right now in flux. And uh, there's all kinds of uh, different sectors within the Republican Party, um, neoconservatives and uh, uh, Tea Party and uh, uh, homosexual Republicans and so on and so forth. But it is this idea that um, unless uh, we adjust to the process the nation is living of uh, increasingly becoming uh, liberal, and unless we speak the language of this culture, we are not going to be able to be uh, electable again. And so there's a lot of uh, change going on even within uh, the conservative party, but also within the church as well as we see, uh, you, you know, my, my main concern right now as I look at uh, uh, the American church is not so much with the liberal church. I think we know where the mainline churches have gone, but it's really with a lot of evangelical churches that are increasingly yes. giving away elements of our faith in the hope of becoming relevant and becoming acceptable to the larger culture. So we see that in the, in the whole homosexual thing right now where increasingly um, you hear these voices of, uh, until now, very evangelical uh, leaders beginning to kind of sound almost like they're willing to give up yes. that element of scripture and uh, to open up the gates of the church to the homosexual movement and to gay marriage because they feel if they don't do that, uh, we will lose the masses. They won't come to our churches. And I think that's the very opposite of what you're saying, uh, which is let's stand our ground Let's trust the Lord, let's stand on principles, and let him be responsible. Mm -hmm. And uh, it may take some time, but he will ultimately bring the ship back into it, to the right course. Mm -hmm. I think it's two different uh, views that are being presented here. We're back to the threat of the religious freedom. Mm -hmm. Back to the same thing back in, uh, in, from Plymouth today. We're facing that same challenge. Mm -hmm. Are we losing our religious freedom? Yeah. You know, uh, the gospel is very clear. His truth will continue to march on. Tides will come, tides will go, but we know, and you're a student of history, Pastor, that anything that rises its hand against God, His knowledge, the truth of Scripture, eventually falls. Uh, we all know that in Christ we're going to win. Where's the church at today? The church is being chastised. The church is being cleansed right now and being rid of her idols. The churches that hang on to the idols, that don't wish to abide by scriptural truth, they're going to fail. Yeah. 
churches like yours, that you hold to the truth right here in Boston, despite the laws that they're making at, uh, at, at City Hall there and at the Capitol building, your church is growing. And his truth will continue to march on. And that's, that's our hope, and that's, and that's what we believe, and that's what we're seeing in Boston. We're seeing it with your church. We're seeing it with others. So um, that's why we're not defeated. We're hopeful. And I know in a moment's time during, gosh, you know, during World War II and the Nazi uh, advancement, everything looked dark, but they're gone. During the Cold War and the, and the Russians were advancing and communism was taking over the world. They're on the ash heap of history. <laughs> we have to just proclaim the truth and let God does what he does, what he does best. Mm -hmm. And he, <laughs> his, his truth will continue to march on. Your foundation is extremely biblical, extremely spiritual. You understand the fact that our struggle is not against uh, flesh or blood, but against principalities and powers. And yet, there's, a, there's an element of specificity as well in what you do. Because you, you're, you don't have just your head in the mystical side of things. You are also acknowledging that there are issues in our political world as well. And you have uh, made some very specific uh, statements as well that um, uh, make us realize that you understand that it's not all just spirituality, that we also need to confront uh, specific things. And this uh, book that you wrote, uh, Phil, Unfit to Rule, um, is uh, quite a statement. Number one, I think it's a it, it reveals your understanding of history and specifically of the Declaration of Independence and what relevance it has today to the present administration. Tell us a little bit about the, the book and what you sought to accomplish through its writing. Well, the book came out of a series that Phil and I did. Um, you are correct. We A radio series? Yeah, a radio series. Um, we believe that what God gave to us in this country is special. We do believe that we are a Christian nation. Maybe we're post-Christian, you know, in some eyes. But at the same time, you can go out and you can do a poll right now, and about 70% of the people in this country would profess Christianity. They would profess to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, whether that's just by words or whatever, they still look at Him. And they realize that our nation is, is that. Well, what gave us our nation? A lot of people don't, you know, we were talking about revival, we're talking about the Great Awakening. The first Great Awakening, you know, right here in this area, you know, all of them have been. But the first Great Awakening, we would, we remember names like uh, Whitfield, Wesley. And um, what happened was Whitfield, literally, the crux of his message was stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Well, the people were not at liberty. The people were under the thumb of England. And, uh, but at a point, they began to, to have this motto. And the motto of America in that day was, we have no king but Jesus. I mean, they're, they're a long ways away from England now. And England wasn't taking care of them. They were having to trust God against the elements and against the, the Indians and against the pestilences and against the diseases. They couldn't trust England to, to you know, protect them from that. They learned to trust in God. And, and Whitfield began to bring that. And so you're right. It did not start. In fact, the churches hated Whitfield. The, the churches were so divided. And you ask again, what's the problem? Are we willing to come together? Well, the churches in that day were not. The Congregationalists hated the Anabaptists, and the Anabaptists hated the... I mean, we could go through it. They didn't like one another. They were not friendly toward one another. Each one of them had their way and their thoughts, and my way is the right way, and any other way is the wrong way. And so the churches would not come together, and they wouldn't let Whitfield in. And so Whitfield went into the open air, and a lot of people think that a revival happened just like that. No, the revival began in about 1706 as far as Whitfield and them going out, but it really didn't culminate until about 15 years later was when it really began to catch fire. Don't despise the day of small things. You know, I think sometimes that's what we do. We think that a small beginning means that God's not in it. When everything begins that way, and God's waiting for our faithfulness. And if we will remain faithful in little things, God will put us over much. And that's exactly what happened. This revival broke out. It birthed a, a 
a liberty in the heart of the people, not a liberty on the outside, but a liberty in the heart. But anything that is in the heart will only come out of the fist and out of the feet and out of the head. I mean, whatever begins, in, you know, whatever's real in you will ultimately become your life. And it became the life of America, it became the life of the colonists. And this life that was in the colonists, ultimately, they went to England, you know, they, they started sending letters to England, you know, man, you're making our life tough. And, and the king of England said, I'm going to make it tougher. You know, it's almost the story of Rehoboam in the Bible, you know, I'm not only going to be as fat as my father, I'm going to, my, my thumb will be fatter than his thigh. And I mean, that was kind of what was happening in America until the people could not any longer stand the tyranny under which. And so they wrote the Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration of Independence, uh, despite what a lot of people think, it's not really a, a historical document in the sense of written to be a document. It's a letter. That's all it is. It's a letter. It's a very specific document. It's, it's just a letter that was written to the King of England that said, we've done everything we can to work with you, to reason with you, to find a compromise with you, and you won't do it. And not only that, but you're making our life tough, er. And for that reason, we're declaring our independence. But here's why. And they gave 27 reasons why they were de declaring independence from the crown. And that book takes those 27 grievances and it goes through them one at a time. And every single one of them are being done to us in a very graphic way today. We are under the exact same tyranny today in America as our founders were uh, in, you know, when, when we declared our independence. Now here's the question. Are we going to be a generation that are willing to stand up and declare our independence against us?